I mean, just give me the rear view mirror perspective on, you know, the making of 72 seasons. Uh, when you looking at it now and the process that it took, you know, remote recordings, Jason Gossman controlling your laptop, <laughs> sorts of places. I mean, does it seem like some faraway crazy dream or can you relate to everything that happened there just as much as at the time it was happening? Yeah, I, I think every Metallica record has its own journey, its own story, its, its own path forward. Uh, they're all unique. Uh, and I think you sort of accept all of them. I, I think the one common thread between all the Metallica records is that they're done with the best intent, the purest intent, um, and always an attempt in that moment to to sort of write the best songs, to create the best collection of songs. Uh, there's a set of practicals that play a role in that at some level. So obviously uh, uh, now with 72 seasons being out, a couple, what, four months, four or five months, four months, um, and and looking back, uh, you know, the record's still very fresh to me. Um, I, I like what I'm hearing. You know, I don't hear it very often, but just uh, six weeks ago uh, when we started uh, the North American run in New York, uh, there were a couple more songs that we wanted to learn. And so I listened to those songs and listen to the record. I don't think I've heard it in six weeks, but um, it sounded really uh, still uh, very uh, sort of fresh, weighty, uh, uh, cohesive. Uh, you know, I've said this many times. I've, I've probably said it every time we've made a record. There's a, what I call the honeymoon period, which is, you know, you make a record, you finish a record, you put that record in your back pocket, and then you go off into the world and um, at some point you listen to that record again and at some point you start having some questions about the choices that were made. Um, and at different records, at different times, that honeymoon period can be short, it can be long, and whatever. Uh, so four or five months later, I still don't have a lot of questions or a lot of, um, uh, I'm, I'm happy with what I'm hearing uh, and I'm appreciative and uh, and 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 I like the choices that were made. The interesting thing about this record is also, and this kind of dawned upon me as I was doing uh, interviews uh, for for seventy two seasons, you know, in the spring and so on, is that every record, through no choice of your own, at least super consciously, I think, is always related to the previous record because you know if you like the previous record that affects where you're going with the next record if you don't like the previous record that affects where you're going with the next record so there's in, in terms of the lineage of the records it the next record is always tethered to the previous record in some way shape or form by the choices that you're making I have made no secret of the fact that uh, Hardwired, uh, certainly for the most part, from 17, what well, came out in 16, so uh, from 16, 17 forward, has been a record that in my uh, years has aged really, really well. And so when we started the process of what became 72 Seasons, um, there was no radical attempt to alter the course forward uh, because Hardwired felt like a really good jumping off point. Um, and so obviously the, the parameters were different in that we were in lockdown. There was a lot of uncertainty. You know, the band was trying to figure out its place. Um, and then, you know, how do we pick the pieces up again? Uh, and, and that's already been talked about a little bit with the black in 2020. And then, you know, the the, the the whole like during this awful and unprecedented time in lockdown um, how do we make music how do we connect to our fans and to our friends and to our family out there and how do we you know make a difference as Metallica uh, and and that eventually then led us to start writing songs and to do stuff uh, like we've talked about 
you know, remotely and through computers and, and Zoom sessions uh, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then eventually ended up here at HQ uh, and, and, you know, uh, masked and, you know, under many COVID restrictions. And as things got more and more uh, along, we got, you know, the process became more and more normalized, whatever that means in the context of, of making a record. So it's, 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 you know, in, 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 in hindsight now, uh, the record's been done five months. Uh, uh, I'm happy uh, with it. We played some of these songs live. Uh, we played eight of them. Uh, super fun to play. Um, I think all eight songs that we've played live are, are connecting. Maybe a few of them uh, slightly uh, at a, a deeper level than others, but with the audience, with the fans. But we're digging what we're doing. Um, and and like I said, you know, the easy way to sum it up is that uh, there's no radical red flags. So one thing that's one thing we have not touched on yet, or you haven't touched on, which is, is extremely significant. It's interesting that that you haven't touched on it in anything you've said is you know, James went back to rehab and James went through, you know, was going through a cycle that I think you're very familiar with. You've lived it before. Um, you know, what, where did that figure in to this album's creation and being written? Uh, what did you have fears at that time? Do you think it made it easier that you weren't all in the same studio? Like, right, we're back in, we've got to work together. Do you think the distance that you had from each other enforced? I mean, that sort of falls into the what if questions and I'm never a big proponent of the what if question. What if uh, this happened instead of that? Well, it didn't. <laughs> so it, 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 we just moved, you know, we, we, we moved forward with, with the situation that we're in. Um, but you're a thinker. You would have considered this. I know somewhere inside you would have thought it through like, well, maybe. I mean, I, I, I can't believe that you would have just moved on and be like, okay, well, it didn't happen or, you know. Well, I'm saying in, you know, as you're, as you're going through, as you're going through a process, you know, there's two parts to it. There's the going through the process and moving forward. And then there is the sitting and talking about it two years later, three years later, and trying to figure out what spin you're going to put on it or what angle you're going to, you know what I mean? So sure, I that, that's, those are two different kinds of things. So to walk through every emotion or every up or down that happened to you at this point or that point, I mean, I, I don't know if I have enough of a, of a sort of a specific memory uh, what James went through in at the tail end of 19 into 20 was something where it really felt like I and the rest of the guys in the band had to give him the space that he needed and had to really take a step back and sort of just suspend everything that, that was on the table. Uh, we needed to do that for our friend and for our uh, our bandmate and our partner. And, um, you know, then slowly the pieces started coming back together uh, in, in the spring of 20. And they started coming back together, obviously, as, as then everything got sideswiped by the uh, horrific uh, pieces of, of, of COVID and the lockdown. And at the same time, like I said before, trying to figure out how does uh, Metallica make a difference? Um, how does, you know, how can music make a difference? Uh, you know, I still can't get away from the analogy I've said a million times, which is you're, 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 you're trying to keep the train on the tracks. You don't want to necessarily force 100% its direction, but you want to make sure that the train doesn't derail. And, and that was, when I think back on, say, 20, 2020, that's, a kind of the overview of that. Uh, obviously, there were a few cu couple things. There was the drive-in, drive-in theater uh, concert, uh, and we were getting back and doing a few different things. And obviously, every time that we got back together, and every time we would do Zoom calls or whatever, we would start understanding kind of what headspace everybody was in and, and what everybody was, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, capable of doing, willing to do, uh, and where 
sort of all the boundaries were uh, at, as you were just trying to move it forward. Uh, but nothing, I, I guess nothing radically different than other times that um, we've been challenged in the past. And um, so there's a part of me that uh, sort of just, uh, you know, you, you, you roll your sleeves up, you want to get back and get engaged, you accept uh, sort of the, the parameters that are put on it and you try to, you know, make progress within within those. And three years later, we have this incredible record and it's hard to believe that a part of what lives in this record in terms of, of the energy, the lyrics, the themes, um, the production, all of it is not somehow correlated to the challenges that were thrown our way. I mean, I, I'm going to stick on this point for a moment because I think it's very important. Um, ironically, I was looking at the uh, 20 Years of Anger uh, on the Black Box um, installation. Um, I remember that period as being um, incredibly challenging uh, for, for, I mean, I guess Metallica, but essentially for you. But equally, I remember you being... Um, you know, you're the custodian. You kind of, you said something there where I guess there's a side of me that rolls up my sleeves and just gets on with it. But you, t you take on the bulwark to push through and to get it done. Do you think that you are someone who finds comfort in the refuge of that hard work at tough times? I mean, you know, if you, you put the jacket on and you put the gloves on and you get in there and you steer the ship uh, is that your way of comfortably dealing with turbulent situations i guess it's a good question the, the first thoughts that come to mind is that the period of time you're talking about is 20 years ago it's exactly more than 22 years ago and so at that time at that time i guess it felt like we were still not far enough into it to fully accept that it could maybe derail. It felt like there was still a lot of, there was still a lot of things that had to be done and said, played, whatever phrase you want to put on it. Now it feels like kind of everything that we're doing is, you know, this is what we do and this is who we are. But at the same time, it feels like people often ask me in interviews, you go like, what are you left to accomplish? And I go, well, the, the thing that's left now is just sticking around. It's almost like you're, you're on borrowed time now. It's like nobody thought that you would be doing this 40 years into your, into your run. Nobody thought that you would be, um, you know, nobody could fathom that when we started, this is, uh, dawned upon me the other day when we started like Mick Jagger, Paul McCartney, all these guys were still in their thirties. So there was no roadmap for playing rock and roll in your late fifties, early sixties, or in the case of say Jagger and McCartney or whatever in their late seventies, early eighties. So everything that, that we're doing now feels like it's sort of bonus the fact that we're here, the fact that we're healthy, the fact that we're playing what may be the best shows of, of, of our run uh, and having the kind of summer that we've had, that's like so fucking insane and so incomprehensible based on the outlook. If, if, if you were saying that in 2002, do you know what I mean? Say 20, 22 years ago. So it feels like a different type of thing because... Um, I think there's a much greater sense of appreciation and gratefulness for what's going on now, where 20 years ago, it felt like an unexpected time out. Uh, now I think we're much more equipped to deal with the bumps in the road and much more uh, mentally accepting of the bumps in the road because you're, you're so appreciative of every element of it and and if you sit down and and kind of look at um, 
you know, it's just, you know, four guys at this level, it's, you know, it's a, you know, you could turn around and go, just the fact that we're like functioning in itself is like a minor miracle. But James and Kirk are, you know, north of 60. Rob and I are knocking on that door. That's fucking crazy uh, that this is still happening. Do you know what I mean? Yes. So it feels like you're you're in so much uncharted, t- or we're in so much uncharted territory, and it feels like rock and roll in itself is in in so much uncharted territory. You know, the Rolling Stones are putting out a record next month or whatever, and yeah, that's, that's all of them. In 40 years, probably. yeah, all of them are. You know, I read yesterday that uh, the Scorpions are celebrating their 60th anniversary in like a year or two or whatever. It's like. It, that is also fucking crazy that everything that's going on just feels like a bonus. All the work that was done, all the prep, do you think when it came to 2019, 2020, 2021, whatever, that you found yourself just more comfortable accepting the dysfunction that inevitably would occur in any collective that's been together for, you know, well, at that point, 39, closing in on 40 years. Um, do you think that there is a, a greater sense of understanding? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the, the word that, that I've heard myself use a lot uh, this year is the word compromise. And so uh, I may have, I've probably used it before, but uh, it, it feels like a more... Uh, relevant part of the journey now and um so one thing is identifying compromise as an element of moving forward another thing is being willing to compromise those are two different things and so i think that um compromise and trust and acceptance uh at least for me comes much easier now than it did i think i'm less uh suspicious of of alternate ways of doing things. And I think um, I, 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 I'm more trusting and comfortable in, uh, you know, it's like James, would, <laughs> I'll give you an example. You know, J- James has a, like I've said 10,000 times and most people know that, you know, James can write five incredible, come, comes up with five incredible riffs when he's tuning his guitar. And so there's always this, like, hey, the thing you just played, somebody put an X next to that or somebody, you know, red star that or whatever. And then 12 seconds later, oh, my God, that could be turned into a song. Or this is an incredible thing or whatever. And James would always kind of go like, ah, it's just there'll be more riffs coming along. And I'd be sitting there going, yeah, well, what if there isn't uh, or what if... Uh, the greatest riff ever just got lost into the ether. And, you know, now you just sit there and go like, I know there's more riffs than we'll ever be able to turn into songs. Uh, when I sit and riff mine and try to figure out what to do with these uh, insane riffs, if there was never another riff that was played between Kurt, Rob, and James, there was enough material that that we could turn into songs that... I could give five stars to and, and say there's a, the seed of a song right there. Then we have time left on this planet. So it's like, it just, okay, just calm the fuck down and just trust. So trust in that everything doesn't need to be a riff that's starred and trust that you'll be okay and trust that, you know, if it's not going to be this way, then it'd be that way and maybe that's not... A, that's just as good. It may not be a vertical movement, but horizontal movements are also fine. Do you know what I mean? And so it, it, you know, it's trusting in, trusting in yourself, trusting in the others, trusting in Greg, trusting in the process, trusting in the energy of the universe, or whatever. And and so I, I think that there's a lot more um, of that type of, of, of resilience in the ranks now, uh, and and a. Uh, uh, you know, a, a comfort in in that everything doesn't have to be um, 
uh, sort of perfect, uh, you know, at any given moment. It, it can just be this, this you know, the, the, the path forward is full of unexpected, um, uh, you know, unexpected uh, twists and turns that uh, ultimately, and I'm not saying that, that you should uh, relinquish control, and I'm not a great believer in, in, in surrendering the whole thing because I do believe that records are uh, the result of choices that you're making and, you know, hopefully mostly conscious choices, but they're also often impulsive choices. And so it can't, uh, you, you, it's about finding the balances. You don't want to get stuck overthinking everything because that can also, uh, you know, put you down a rabbit hole that's no fun to go down when you have your own studio and, and you, you don't necessarily have deadlines and you don't necessarily have maybe budgetary restrictions or whatever, you know what I mean? So yeah. there are some fine balances here, but certainly um, the head spaces, uh, I feel, are in a much, well, not just healthier places, but I think a much more um, accepting, and I just keep wanting to come back to the word trusting places uh, you know so accepting and trusting i think are two good words to to sort of navigate through what 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 your question is so who have you tethered or what have you tethered to to help you get to this to this place what are you tethering to that's yeah that you trust that's stopping you do that and maybe stopped you do that on this record is it greg is well it's, it's it certainly it? greg i mean it's certainly greg uh it's certainly james um uh, it's certainly, obviously, Kirk and Rob, it, but it's also trusting in just in, in the process. And I think um, that it's, uh, it's uh, you know, there's a quest to make it as great as it can be, but as great as it can be can show up in many different ways. There may not just be one as great as it can be destination. So if you accept that there are many versions of as great as it can be. And obviously I'm talking somewhat abstract and maybe exaggerating a little bit, but there can be many different destinations uh, and each one of those destinations don't necessarily have to be ranked in order or vertically. So, you know, destination three may not be the, a better destination than two and four. It's just a different landing zone, you know what I mean? So it it... Now, if the record lands here, it's this kind of record. If the land record lands here, it's that kind of a record. But certainly, I think that Greg is the uh, the gatekeeper. Uh, Greg is um, uh, now 15, 16 years in, I guess, um, to this relationship is somebody I just, I trust completely it's like a hundred and ten percent um it, 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 i just realized i was um i i just realized you know uh i realize a lot in interviews when i sit and hear myself yap about all the crazy things we do i realized that for instance the drum sound if you take the drum sound to use that that word that statement, you know, back in the day, it's like the drum sound. I would sit with Fleming. I would sit with Bob Rock. Okay, the snare drum needs to sound more like this or do this or more top or more bottom or make it bigger or make it, you know, have more of uh, the hit or the whatever. And I we would sit for weeks and I've talked about, you know, on the Black Album, you know, we spent, you know, five days moving baffles around and you know, walking around in a room trying to figure out whether the snare drum sounds 5% better and, you know, all this stuff with mixing and, you know, I don't think on this project in 72 seasons that I had one, one conversation with Greg about how the drum should sound. Like, literally not one. At no point did I ever sit there and go, hmm, What's up with the snare drum? What's up with the toms? Very it's just completely just trusting that these drums would sound the best they could and focusing more on playing them 
and uh, letting myself go into, you know, so it's... Well, we talked about that. It's, it's, I mean, we said in the, uh, earlier when we, were t when we off record were talking about this project ages ago, I said it sounded like probably your most comfortable and, and relaxed performance. I mean, we talked about that. So well, this but, is yeah, very... and that's, you know, the stuff that Greg and I speak more about. It's like, uh, you know, when do, the, when do the drums sound the best? The drum sounds the best... I hate talking in the third person, but the drums sound the best no, when the drummer is not thinking. But the drums sound the best when the drummer is not thinking about how they sound. It's really that simple, you know. And the drummer is just playing them, uh, and letting himself loose, surrender to to just the playing, and not wait. Is, is there enough of this or that on tom number two or whatever, you know? So it's all of that, at least for me has gone out the window. But my sense is, I wasn't there when James was going through his guitar sounds and so on, but my sense is that the process for everybody uh, is, is much uh, shorter because, you know, Greg just knows us better and between Death Magnetic and Lulu and Through the Never and... Um, all the different things, uh, you know, around hardwired and all the different things we've done. He just knows us more and more. So that trust is, is, is unquestioned and, and is, is, is just, is such a big part of, of a creative partnership. Yeah. I mean, let me throw this as a further curve as you've got, as you've, uh, uh, matured in life or got older, whatever phrase you want to use. I mean, do you think there's, and I don't think you've ever been someone who's overly concerned with comments on your abilities and your playing, but do you think you just become so unconcerned about this stuff that perhaps it's translated in you being able to focus more on just the nature of performance versus how it actually is sounding on the record and how, you know, that being tethered to those, you know, very, very specific details, which in the end, your producer helps you uh, achieve, you know, w without you having to deep dive. I mean, do you think there's just such a like maybe more maybe you're more comfortable with with playing and with drumming than you've ever been? Is that is that fair to say that you've reached a point of comfort that you maybe haven't had before? I think that's fair to say. I mean, it's not. I, what's the what's the opposite? It is not unfair to say. Uh, so I, in this moment. I guess I'm very content with where it's, it's all sitting right now. And I'm also very content with, with where it's been sitting in the past. But I guess the, the idea of somehow regret, regret is an interesting word because it's, there's so much weight in that. So it's, it's, I guess it's, you know, do you, I think as human beings, you can't not regret things that you've done in the past, but regret does not necessarily equate that you wish you had changed it because in, it is part of a, I don't think, so if you, if you, if you do as, a, as, a, as an experiment, say, you know, what do you think of the sound of injustice for all? And then, you know, there's 5,000, different opinions about how the, the record that sounds. And then you sit and go, well, do you regret this or do you regret that or whatever? But you can't have the Black Album the way the Black Album is and came to be without the choices that were made on the Justice Album. Yeah. You can't have Death Magnetic and the choices that were made on that record without saying anger and and what what that was so it's all tethered together in a way that that just makes it it's it just kind of it becomes a useless conversation at some point <laughs> okay. so it, yeah, yeah. it it you know because everything is 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 part of, of a bigger picture and i guess uh but I, I am very good at accepting the journey so You've got better at it. Let's be blunt. I think surely you would admit that you've got much better at accepting the, the, the you know, the, the idiosyncrasies of the past or the, the f potential foibles. I mean, you, you, I th think it's fair to say 
this may not have happened 10, 15 years ago in terms of accept such what I would call right. radical. But it's not limited. But it's not limited to accepting the Metallica okay. path. It's also, <laughs> it's it's yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it's also accepting all the other elements yeah, yeah. in my life. Or you know, it it's yeah. it's part of a path forward. And Metallica is 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 one of those elements in that. So it's not a grateful recipient, I would say. Yeah, and it's hard to believe that uh, in the journey of human beings and as they age, um, that that's not something that happens to, not maybe not all, but to either somewhere between a significant portion or most people. You know, especially, especially when you throw, and we've talked about this, when you throw children and offspring uh, into the mix of of you know and and again I've talked about these analogies before that you know when you are not a father you have a tendency to only think of yourself and when you become a father or children you often most of the time think about your children before yourself so and yes, cue the jokes and cue the, the you know, uh, asterisks and all that. I, I, I understand that. But I'm generalizing. So, you know, when you then you start thinking of others before yourself. So it, it, that plays a role in, in how you function in a group. Because there's a difference between functioning in a group in your 20s or functioning in a group in your 60s. And probably uh, by the time, say, now we talked about the Rolling Stones getting to the age of functioning in a group in your 80s. So all of that's part and parcel of moving forward on life's journey without getting overly philosophical. But you can't, you can't isolate one element of the journey forward without acknowledging the rest of the elements. Is there a moment that you think you may all look at each other and say, enough? We lock the door on those riff tapes. We leave them alone. There may be, you know, 300 riff tapes. We're not going to touch them for the next project. We're going to start from scratch and thus a new revolution. Our records rely on the physicality and rely on, on, on a mix between the impulsive and the thoughtful, but you, you, know, you don't want to end up in places where it's all thought and all reasoning and all purpose. Uh, so it usually seems to me that it functions best when it's a little bit of all of that. Uh, so now, if there's a challenge, you know, I mean, I'm 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 quite. I spent a lot of time in the com in in the comedy world, and um, one thing that fascinates me greatly about, especially the the very best comedians. Um, is that they'll usually like write a bunch of material and then they'll go out and perform that material and then oftentimes they'll film it for a special at the end of that run of performing the material then the special will come out and then they'll throw all the material away and then they'll start over again and write a whole new set of material now obviously I don't know if the material in say Chris Rock's 22 special was all written in 20 and 21. I'll never know. It could be that some of the bits were written in 8, 10, 12, or 14. I'll never know. But the idea that you take it all and throw it away and never perform it again is really interesting to me because it's a little bit like saying we're going to go out on the 72 seasons tour and never play anything from before 72 seasons. Do you know what I mean? So it's, it's you know, uh, that's interesting to me. You know, why in music do you go back and revisit the past? And in some cases, you know, a lot of classic acts, you know, whatever, will only revisit the past, will only spend time in the past. And new material is non-existent or inconsequential. That's, those are interesting um, uh, questions to me. And, and it's, it, they're interesting um sort of how different it is, but still how much I feel that comedy and music actually have in common in terms of the creative things. But that's one place where they radically differ from each other. But 
so if you said sort of uh, as a, an experiment or as a challenge to yourself, you know, try to only come up with something that's in that moment. I guess you could argue, I mean, if I take a quick trip uh, down the past, I mean, you could argue that the Lulu record um, was probably the closest uh, that we've come to that because off the top of my mind, and I may not be correct, but it, off the top of my mind, most of the music that was behind Lou's uh, singing and lyrics was stuff that was given birth to kind of on the floor in a certainly a much more spontaneous fashion than a lot of the Metallica stuff that we've tackled ourselves over the year. So I guess you could answer your question by saying that Lulu may be... Um, may be the closest to that um but i see no i guess i see no reason to do that unless there's some sort of creative challenge to yourself or creative ultimatum to yourself but i would i guess i would wonder whether it would be for the better at if, if that was presented by any of the four members or by Greg or by somebody on our team or whatever. Yeah, I gotcha. Yeah. Let's talk about that physicality um, uh, aspect, the physicality of the music, the physicality of uh, 72 seasons and how it's, uh, how it's played into the live performances and how it's played into how you're preparing. I mean, I, I don't think it's uh, uh, either, obse I don't think it's obsequious or superfluous to say you're probably in the best shape that you've been in uh, maybe ever actually. I don't know if you've ever been in better physical shape. Um, I suppose beyond, I mean, the obvious question I would have is is what has driven that? Um, is it uh, knowing that you're going to be performing these very physical songs? Is it learning what it takes to perform these very physical songs in the very physically challenging environment of the 72 season stage, which we should also touch on? You know, you're in rehearsing. I've never seen you fucking rehearse like this in my life on tour. I mean, let it not be a secret. Everyone is saying it. They're like, Christ, he's fucking... They've never seen this guy practice like this. No, it's the, the truth. Yeah, no, thank like, you. No, thank you. It was like, what? Thank you. This, I, is, this is kind of, you know... And, and we had, you know, I mean, you were in... I think I remember it was in, in Texas the night before a rehearsal. You were in till like 1 or one thirty, like ruminating on, on something. That was, you know, and uh, so you know where I'm going with this. So, so. Well, I, I appreciate what you're saying, uh, and thank you. I, um, it's a, it, the short answer is it's probably a little bit of all of it, uh, uh, and and uh, you know, I, I agree. I mean, I feel good, uh, uh, and f feeling good makes me feel good. It, to sort of not sound too silly about it but I've actually I've arrived at a place that I really enjoy being and it's a place that um, I feel like I have the uh, ability to maintain without driving myself batshit crazy uh, it, it feels like where I am right now again I feel really good I've made some pretty conscious uh, changes in my diet I've made some pretty, I basically don't drink anymore. Um, I, I drank, I don't know, probably a handful of times this year. I can tell you I haven't had a drink since April. Um, so five months. Um, and it's for no, there's no cosmic reason other than I like to enjoy sort of not drinking. I The last time I had a couple of glasses of champagne in April um, and it tasted like sugar water and <laughs> I didn't really enjoy the taste of it. And um, I'm, uh, and um, so I've made serious changes to my diet. Uh, I basically don't drink. Uh, I basically don't do sugar. I don't eat dessert anymore and uh, I don't eat junk food. Uh, but I also don't... Um, I used to kind of allow myself, it's like, okay, I'm 
going, 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 and now I can have a pizza. I'm going, 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 and now I can eat this crazy dessert. Or I'm going, 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 and now I can allow myself a cheat day, as they're called, or whatever. And I don't do any of that anymore. It, um, I don't really enjoy it to be honest with you I it's it's like I don't want to be disrespectful to pizza <laughs> but it's like the idea of eating a slice of pizza just doesn't do anything for me I'm, so I eat kind of the same the same mushy stuff every day and I feel very very happy doing it and you I do love enjoy food you love food do. so th there's no, I mean, be a little I do, more I, I mean do, you're well, one I, of I, you're one of the great I mean you really do love food I mean people should know for the record I mean you right I'll yes I put I, together I, some fantastic dinners in your time yes and I still enjoy uh you know going to a, a you know a place where somebody will take a vegetable and do something to it that nobody else has done before but I'm not you know, it's limited to vegetables or it's limited to, uh, uh, you know, what um, what somebody with a great imagination can do to vegetables. And I'm sort of exaggerating, but not completely exaggerating because there is a truth to it. So, uh, yes, we're fortunate enough to go to some pretty crazy, cool restaurants, but the ones that turn me on are the ones that, are, that come more from a creative place of what can you do to, you know, I think... If you look at all the creative art, art forms, you know, film and painting and sculpture and literature and music and whatever else now, food and the culinary world has a seat at that table, pardon the pun. And I think that um, uh, there are so many incredible chefs and, and, uh, and, and people in the culinary world out there that are doing amazing things uh, to reinventing the idea of food and meals and preparations and what can be done uh, with it. And that's certainly exciting. But the more traditional things um, that I've eaten in the past don't do a lot for me right now. But then the other element of this is I'm just really enjoying um, uh, being very, very rigid with my workouts. Uh, the Peloton um, came to me accidentally uh, during lockdown. I was more of a running guy and a treadmill guy. Uh, and I started developing some knee issues uh, during the pandemic because I was on the, uh, on the treadmill so much. Uh, and Jess uh, was on the Peloton, on the bike. And I started doing the bike and realized that I may actually be getting a better cardio workout on the Peloton bike, enjoying it more, and maybe also feeling that the cardio workout, as far as the legs are concerned, are more um, uh, in line with keeping the legs in shape for drumming, uh, double bass, songs like One, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They seem to be, uh, it seems to, at the moment certainly come easier than it has in the past. And then I'm also doing a lot of core stuff. And I'm just really enjoying it. Uh, and I enjoy um, so much of playing these shows in this stage setup uh, is about your headspace um, and is about uh, your confidence uh, and about feeling safe out there this is a, a stage you know that the, the new states that we've been playing on since april is one um there's no hiding places there's no safe zones there's no way to dock and cover or to take a break or whatever so you have to be in the moment and you're completely accessible and therefore vulnerable for every moment that you're on stage. Uh, and so I guess that all the work I'm doing gives me the highest level of confidence to get through that. Um, and it feels like there are times where I'm sitting there and briefly for a second I'll access something and go like, that's why you do all that fucking work that you do or whatever because of moments like right now. And of course, I mean, what have we played 
uh, 20 shows, give or take, uh, on the stage. Um, I guess I was so, um, so uncertain of what it would be like to be this exposed up on stage and all of us, you know, like I was talking to a friend yesterday, it was just like, you guys have no amplifiers up there. You know, you know, there's no place for a guitar player to turn and get feedback from a speaker or you don't have this or there's no place, you know, for a drummer to kind of just take a time out and whatever, you know, because you there's just, so you're completely in every moment. And I guess I was so, uh, fearful is the right word but I was uh, so conscious of that before that I wanted to make sure that I would um, um, uh, that I was as mentally and physically prepared for whatever that would feel like leading up to it in April and then um, in the course of that preparation I found myself actually really enjoying the rigidity of it and the discipline of it and now I've stuck with it and, you know, I've been, you know, we played the Phoenix, the second Phoenix show uh, last Saturday. Today's Friday. Uh, I've been, you know, I took Sunday off, but I started my workouts on Monday. Uh, and I've worked out at the same level every day this week, even though we don't have any shows for the next three weeks. And I really enjoy it. And um eating the same tofu and vegetable based mush every meal since then that I have all summer and nothing's changed and I don't think anything is going to radically change at least in the foreseeable future because I feel really good and I enjoy um, feeling this way and, and I am um, there's definitely less of me than there has been a few years ago and uh, I enjoy uh, being a little lighter and um, and uh, also feeling stronger on stage. Let's look at the stage for a second. Uh, I felt when everyone stepped out for the first time in the Johan Cruyff Arena and saw the physical realization of the cocktail napkin sketch, if you'll pardon the, the riff there, um, it was possibly a little overwhelming. So do you think that, I mean, I observed that maybe those first um, uh, maybe I'll say until um, till Gothenburg that there was definitely, you know, some uh, really getting used to things and that when the tour moved to America, North America, it seemed like the combination of football stadiums and just finally learning this stage, it all seemed to start to click in New Jersey until finally there was this tremendous crescendo moment, if you will, of SoFi Stadium, which I think people would widely recognize as probably two of the, 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 the sort of the biggest nights that this band has, has ever had in venues of that size. I mean, stadiums, it, it all fucking came together. Um, would you bring me, would, well, first of all, would you reflect on whether that's an accurate perception of your journey through this 72 season stage and production? Um, and, and, and if it isn't like, you know, fill in the spaces. I. I, I agree with the bigger picture assessment of that. I mean, it, it definitely uh, lived on a napkin and lived uh, in email chains uh, in the computer for a year, year and a half. Um, and and uh, you know, we've tried for so long to figure out how to tackle playing in the round in stadiums that I think that there was a, a kind of an aloofness to the fact that the uh, we were just when we finally tackled it here now that, that we were just going and play in the round in stadiums with the same ease that we've played in the round in arenas for uh, 32 years I guess since 91 on the Black Album, but I don't think we were quite prepared for the size of this and truly understood the size of it, and also you know the one main difference is that when we've played in the past. There's always been a kind of a center point in, in, in anything that's round. There's usually a center. And so um, most of the time, not all, but most of the time, the set center point has been the drums. And um, so most of it, 
you know, would sort of take place in a circle with the drums in the center. And the early sketches of this uh, did have the drums in the middle. And then there were some challenges presented to Dan Brown about what would happen if that center point went away and, and what would happen, Dan Brown, a designer, and what would happen if, if you sort of did a 180 of that model and then the whole idea of having the snake pit be the center point and then playing around uh, that snake pit and so on and then all of it started coming together. But I don't think any of us were prepared for the sheer scale of it. Uh, so one thing is the stadiums, another thing is the size of the stage and, and all of that. And, and it just nobody really put that together. And so when we were at Johan Cruyff Stadium for those couple of weeks in Amsterdam, I mean, it was just a sheer uh, uh, process of just getting to know this uh, setup, getting to understand it, uh, getting to be familiar with how it would work you know, with an audience, and more importantly, how we would work with each other. Um, and, uh, but also obviously the other factors, the sound, the video screens, the lights, all of it. So the practicals are moving forward as the crew and everybody is getting more understanding of what's working and what's not working. And the, the, our stuff is moving forward as uh, we're figuring out what's working and what's not working. It, it was pretty clear in the beginning that the sheer distance, you know, if James is opposite me, uh, what is he, like 30, 40 yards away? Uh, it, I mean, it, 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 you know, there's so much about when you're playing music, about eye contact and about, you know, I can almost, I could probably play to a degree a lot of just knowing where his hand is on the neck or just seeing like what he's doing with his left hand uh, when he's 30 yards behind me in a different zip code, uh, you know, in a different part of Europe behind me. That's a, that's a, that's a challenging thing, especially when you get off. Um, so all that had to be figured out and conquered. Uh, and there were some changes that were made about sort of, each drum kit starting out closer together before eventually everybody would then sort of start going to different corners of the stage and figuring out how to... Acting uh, like a charging to, station for all yeah, of them, right? Yeah, that, that's a good way to put it. Um, but also, uh, you know, have a conversation with Greg Fiddleman about what role confidence plays in your ability to play and perform. Um, uh, and I mean, it, it, it's just, it's such a significant part of it, so, but it goes all the way around. I mean, it goes to every one of our amazing crew members and them understanding their role in it, uh, from our backline guys to all the guys that are doing the visuals and the audio cues and, you know, whether it's, uh, Greg who does our sound, a different Greg, not Fiddleman, uh, whether it's Gene who does our video, whether it's Rob who does our lights, you know, uh, all the different stuff that's going on, obviously, uh, uh, it all moves forward in tangent, uh, in, in different lanes. Uh, but yes, I would agree that the uh, North American shows, uh, it felt like after th three, four months, it was really coming together. But I, I do think also, you know, the, uh, the schedule, uh, you know, the schedule was put together probably a year, year and a half ago, at least. Um, and I think that um, it's more conducive to, uh, to, to, you know, there was, it's hard, uh, it's hard to explain the whole, you know, people ask me in the, in the meet and greets and all the time, it's like, why are you picking these cities and what, you know, and then there's a whole thing about like availability of venues and there's a whole thing about what's called routing and there's a whole thing about, you know, trucking and, you then, you know, if the gear has got to go from one place to another, do you truck it? Do you fly it? If it's got to go from Europe to America, from America, you know, Bob, do you ship it? Do you, you know, there's like all these like crazy practical things. Which, by when the way, caring. has been thrown off by COVID as well. I mean, that's not... Yeah, no, I mean, there's, a whole, to there's a whole slew that. of things that you don't need to get into, but it's, it's, it's really... Uh, 
if complicated is the right word, but there's many pieces to the puzzle. And so um, uh, it feels like, uh, you know, we played the shows in Amsterdam. We were there for a couple of weeks and then we took a two or three week break. You know, so, you know, in a perfect world, you know, after Amsterdam, you know, if we would have played the Paris show the following week or, you know, sort of been in it rather than take, taking breaks and, and, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's, the schedule is a schedule and you learn from the schedule. Sometimes, you know, the schedule is based on the availability of the venues. Sometimes the schedule is based on something else. There's different things schedules can be based around. So let's just say that the, um, the, the schedule in North America of doing it every weekend like clockwork, Friday and Sunday, uh, I think it was more conducive to um, to a higher level of uh, of uh, of consistency uh, in the shows, and um, by 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 merely just being in it and 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 grinding it uh, weekend after weekend, it just it made the progress more noticeable, and the. Uh, acclimatization and, and the, the comfort more noticeable and, and I'll agree with you by the time we hit uh, Arlington uh, by the time we hit LA I mean we were uh, uh, just uh, we were on it we were in like in, in fifth or sixth gear depending on how many gears you have in that particular car and and um, and also you know the, the venue has something to do with it the you know definitely you know the the newer venues have a tendency to have the sides closer. Uh, uh, if you're playing in an NFL stadium, uh, if there's no running track or, 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 or soccer pitch, you know, there's all this stuff, you know, how far away the sides are, all these practical things I don't need to bore you with. But um, certainly uh, Arlington, uh, a.k.a. Dallas-Fort Worth and... SoFi in Los Angeles were, I'd say, among the best shows we've ever played in in the whole run, uh, in the whole 42-year run, I would say. Yeah, I mean, and let it not be said that you're almost playing a third show every week because there is a full rehearsal uh, that's pretty much going down the night before the first one, right? I mean, it's... Yeah, I mean, these... Uh, when you play arenas, whatever it is you're dealing with is more consistent. So I'm sitting here looking at a, a plaque here that says London the O2, Manchester Arena, Birmingham Genting Arena, and Glasgow the SSE Hydro. You know, the, the consistency before those, uh, the consistency of those four venues is probably closer together than say when you play stadium A, B, C, and D. So we, um, we figured that you know, in the past, as you know, uh, I'm sound checked a lot, um, and uh, and that's that. <laughs> but now we're sound checking, and because every every stadium has a different set of circumstances, practical set of circumstances, so we do do a full uh, usually on the Thursday because most of these shows are Friday and Sunday. We do 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 a full, you know, sometimes hour and a half sound check or a couple hours or whatever we do on Thursdays that really gets us situated into that particular stadium and with that particular set of circumstances uh, sound wise and uh, all these stadiums just have vastly different setups and you know, some of them have roofs some of them don't have roofs some of them have are more bowl like some of them are more you know um outliers and have different configurations the stadium in montreal um uh, the olympic stadium is built in the early 70s i believe so it has a, a kind of a different configuration they used to play baseball in there so there's some different things you know the uh, state farm stadium in phoenix where the cardinals plays has a different setup because they roll the field in and out so all of them have different different practicalities to it that are uh, you know, really different than when you go through the arenas, which are much more consistent. And 18,000 seat, you know, arena in London is not radically different than, I don't know, um, 
Madison Square Garden or uh, whatever venue in uh, L.A. or Shanghai or wherever you end up playing. All right, let's let's close off with this for the moment. I, I just, again, to split question. What's it fucking like being on one of those kits on this stage? Like, put yourself in the moment. It's very intense. Is Intense is a good word. It's very, very intense. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a place you have to work up to. Um, I feel that, uh, you know, the prep now, I'm two hours in prep now. Uh, actually more like two and a half, uh, I guess, between food and stretching and Peloton warm-ups and more stretching <laughs> and still some more stretching and some massaging uh, and playing for 30, 40 minutes. Like, you know, uh, and I've said this before, you know, when we walk out on stage and play the first song, I've usually been playing about 40, 45 minutes by that time. You're really working your way into a zone. Uh, but to be up on that stage and be comfortable, I mean, you just have to get to a place of, of kind of um, focus uh, and um, uh, just, in, yeah, I, I, the two words are focus and intensity. I, you know, I don't know what else to put out there. Um, but at the same time, I think you feel... Uh, feel quite safe up there uh, in terms of um, it feels like everybody's there to share in an experience and you know when it does go belly up uh, like it has a couple times um, it all feels sort of very good natured um, it's been a couple of times where something is left out or uh, you know, this happens or that happens and, and then we sort of try to laugh across uh, across the stage and get on with it. Um, those moments are, are thankfully fewer and further between than maybe they've been in the past. Uh, maybe everybody is, is more focused than they've been. Uh, but, the, but like I said, there's also the, the element of safety in that it feels... Um, like everybody's there to share an experience. And I will go back to kind of to the thing you, you had a reaction to the word uh, borrow time. Maybe there's a, a, a different analogy, maybe more like sort of extra innings or I, I don't know what, what it is. Maybe you're on overtime, whatever. But there's a, there's a, a thing about, uh, I guess it goes back to the thing about accepting, but you accept who you are and you accept your... Um, your strengths and you accept your weaknesses and you accept uh, the things that can happen and you accept uh, the team spirit of it. Um, there was one time in Gothenburg where there was a miscommunication about a set list thing and I went up on stage and the rest of the band went up on stage and the drums were not there. <laughs> um, you accept it. <laughs> No, nobody get nobody gets finger whacked or it's like well maybe we should just make sure and communicate that particular thing better or you accept that that happened or somebody does this or whatever so um but it feels uh I guess safer than it's ever felt and that maybe post pandemic post lockdown coupled with uh, um. You know this idea that that you're not supposed to be playing this kind of music 42 years into your run. You're not supposed to be playing this kind of music uh, in your late 50s, early 60s. Coupled with the fact that um, this kind of music is not supposed to bring this amount of people together in this day and age. Uh, whatever it is that whatever angle you look at it from um, that you that it becomes a celebration or and that you um, are um, appreciative of of the fact that it fucking exists or functions or can still 
um, come together like it does, and and it's pretty surreal, I guess, is is uh, is is another word when I sit up on stage and kind of think about it. I gotta ask you, and this is the final. There's still a little bit of fuck you. We're still doing it, whatever you fucking think, right? There's still some of that in there. There's still a little bit of the triumph. But it's not. But it doesn't. It doesn't come from a posturing place, and it doesn't come from a chest beating place, and it doesn't come from a middle finger kind of place. It comes more from a, a place of disbelief. It's more fuck like hard rock and heavy metal connects with people at this level still. I guess more that. And if we're the, if we're the, the, uh, if we're sort of the, the ones carrying that forward, um, then obviously that fills me with pride and appreciation and gratefulness. But I don't know that it it certainly doesn't come from a chest beating kind of hey, look how fucking awesome we are. Um, it it just doesn't. I, I, I this is not something that I think about in that sense um it it just feels like it's uh, as a believer in in a type of music and as a, a as a fan of a type of music and as, as a proponent of a type of music um it makes me proud that that it's still happening at this level 